Hi, everyone, and welcome to another AP Environmental Science Lecture. Today, we're going to continue our lesson on air currents, and we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at how the factors that drive atmospheric currents, and not only that, but we're going to look at how Earth's rotation is going to affect the movement of these currents. So now we're looking at the global scale. A uh, quick review is remember that as air heats at the surface, it's going to rise, and we discussed it's going to cool adiabatically, and which usually forms clouds and precipitation. And as a result of that air becoming much cooler, it's going to condense and sink back to Earth and warm adiabatically, and the whole process goes on and on. So the goal of this lecture is to take that idea, um, how we looked at it locally, and move forward and look at how it's affecting the Earth globally. So there are these cells that we have, we call them cells, and these, they're the atmospheric convection currents, and there's four of them, and we're going to look at each of them individually with our Hadley cell, our intertropical convergence zone, which, we, which uh, is usually just referred to as the ITCZ, the polar cell, and finally, the feral cell. So thinking how um, air will rise, warm air will rise and cool adiabatically, and knowing what we already understand about the seasons is it makes sense that at the equator somewhere on the earth that is more or less getting a majority of the earth's direct sun rays we have air that is um, getting heated so again as a result it's going to rise and cool adiabatically and what we notice is around 30 degrees north and south this is where that um, cold air is sinking and it's these Hadley cells um, where they converge is what we call the intertropical convergence zone. And we'll see, look at more of them uh, a little bit closer in a second here. But what I want to point out in this uh, diagram is, again, here we are on the equator. You have that warm air rising, cooling adiabatically. This makes perfect sense is why we see most of our tropical, or almost all of our tropical um, ecosystems near the equator. And then as it rises, remember, cold air wants to sink, and it deposited all of its moisture near the tropics. So if we look both at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south on the globe, that is where all of Earth's deserts are. And uh, being in Las Vegas, Las Vegas 36 degrees north makes sense why the Mojave Desert is where it is. Something else that's very important to point out is our review on seasons. Remember, there is only one point on Earth that is getting hit directly 90 degrees by the sun's rays. And that can only be between the two tropics. In this case, 23 and a half degrees north, the Tropic of Cancer, and 23 and a half degrees south, the Tropic of Capricorn. So again, if we look at the graph, the roughly the equator is there, and we know that the equator gets the sun's direct rays at 90 degrees at the equinox. So this would be in September or uh, March, where the sun's rays would be hitting the Earth at the equator. But remember, as the Earth revolves, remember this takes 365 days, as it revolves, the sun is either going to move further north or south in the sky. So if we go over to the first day of summer, now the Tropic of Cancer is receiving the Earth or the sun's direct rays. This part of the Earth has more intense insulation. So notice the July intertropical con continental zone. It's a little further north of the equator, which makes sense. And I'm sure you all can guess what happens in December when the sun's rays are directly hitting the Tropic of Cancer at 90 degrees. We see the uh, January ITCZ, and that's dipping a little bit, a uh, little bit further south in areas. And if you notice, it's moving farther north in the northern hemisphere. And something to point out is if you cut the Earth in half at the equator, you may notice that there's quite a bit more land in the northern hemisphere than in the uh, southern hemisphere. This is why the July ITCZ is so much further north that compared to the Januarys. Know this, that land heats up much faster than water. So with more land being the northern hemisphere, the heat equator rises much more uh, further north than the January ITCZ does um, for the south. So there we have it. There's our Hadley cells and um, the air rising with precipitation. We have our deserts on the 30, 30s, both north and south, and we're going to move on to our polar cells. This is uh, between the 60 and 90 degrees north and south, and just as uh, you can expect, polar cells, these are our cold air, air masses. 
So here we have, again, it's much easier if you start at the equator just assuming and knowing that that is where uh, the sun is getting directly hit by, or the earth is getting directly hit by the sun. Air is rising, it's sinking at the 30s. And then it's between 30 and 60. Remember, the air has to travel along the surface. Between 30 and 60, it's heating up again. And as a result, it's rising at 60, and it's going to cut back to 30. And then we have our small polar cell in between 60 and 90. We do have that feral cell, which is responsible for um, quite a few of the mid-latitude tropical storms that we see in the continental U.S. It's just a small cell between the polar and the Hadley cell. And again, it's bringing more moist air. And when that runs into cold, dry air, that's why we see uh, the violent storms we do in the central and eastern United States. And this is due to the feral and polar cells colliding. So here we have, again, our more cross view starting at the equator. And again, it makes sense why we have our ecosystems or biomes and climates where they are. Warm air rising, condensing, giving us our tropics. We have all of Earth's deserts around 30 degrees. Most of the violent weather, again, mixing with warm, moist air that, and cold air coming from the south. We're going to finish this lecture looking at the Coriolis effect. And this is what we were talking about introducing the lesson. Warm air or uh, air isn't just going to go in a straight direction. And it's due to this uh, rotation. And not only the rotation, but the fact that it rotates much faster at the equator than it does as you move further north. So what this is going to have, again, what it's gonna, this is going to cause happen is this faster rotation speed is going to deflect the things moving north or south from the equator. And the good example to look at is imagine being on a merry-go-round with another person who's initially straight across from you before you start spinning. So you're going to toss that person a ball, and as the merry-go-round is spinning, it doesn't make it make doesn't the person has already moved from that initial point you threw it to. So the earth works in the same way, and we're going to kind of use this crazy idea of a Trains on the equator, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And we're going to kick a ball from the blue train to the red train, both north and south. And if the earth was how it is in this picture, not rotating, the kick it straight, the ball will go in the net. But remember, equator, it's moving faster. And as you move up north or south, it's moving slower. So if we were to kick this ball in a straight line, you'll notice that where we aimed, the net has already moved because the blue train is moving much faster than the two red trains. So there's something very important I want to point out here, though, is that if you were to follow the path of the object, in this case the soccer ball, in the northern hemisphere, notice which way you would be veering or which way are you being deflected. The soccer ball is being deflected to the right. And it's vice versa for the southern hemisphere. Again, if I'm going to follow the path of the soccer ball, I'm being deflected to the left. So that is just a given fact that objects in the northern hemisphere get deflected to the right. Objects in the southern hemisphere get deflected to the left. And this gives us our prevailing winds. So again, if you follow that arrow from beginning to end in the northern hemisphere, you can see every arrow is veering to the right. And again, here we have... Uh, 30 degrees south to the equator, which you'd expect would be a straight line. But again, the Earth is rotating, so the object is veering to the left. So make sure you know that. And here's everything all put together. We have our cells, the air rising at the equator, sinking at the 30s, and as a result, the weather patterns we have on Earth. And we have our trade winds and our westerlies and our... Um, Southeast trade winds, again, being deflected due to the Coriolis effect. And if we look at this animation here, we can see it in action. Um, this is actual wind speeds taken, and you can see that how objects in the southern hemisphere are moving to the left, objects in the northern hemisphere are moving to the right. So there's your lesson on um, atmospheric or uh, currents and the Coriolis effect. Should you have any questions, shoot me an email, and as always, you can go back and check out this lesson. See you later.